Hello, 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 and welcome back to the More Money Podcast. This is episode 277, and I'm your host, Jessica Morehouse. Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited. This is surprisingly, because I just said that I've done 276 episodes so far, this is 277. I have never had a guest from UK on the show, which is don't you think that's weird? Like that seems crazy to me. How has that happened? I don't know. It wasn't intentional. Um, but uh, luckily, I actually have two uh, people from the UK that are um, going to be on the show. But for for the first one, the kind of inaugural um, UK guest, I have someone I've been following on Instagram and YouTube for a while. I absolutely love what he's doing in the personal finance space and just love his way of sharing knowledge, you know, um, and information about, you know, how to be financially independent and manage your money properly with just such a positive spin. Maybe it's his like lovely smile that just makes you feel so happy, but I love what he's doing. So I couldn't wait to have him on the show. And luckily I got him. I got him. And uh, of course, I'm talking about Ken Okorafor. He is the founder and CEO of the Humble Penny and the Financial Joy Academy platforms that he runs with his wife with the core missions of helping 10,000 families achieve financial independence and money joy in their lives this decade. So pretty cool, uh, you know, kind of uh, mission that he has with his platforms. Um, So his work has been featured across so many media outlets, BBC, ITV, Financial Times, Sunday Times, The Guardian, Metro, just name them. He's probably been on them. Uh, But what's really cool about his story, and he does share this in our interview, is um, just his origin story. So he began his life as a first-generation immigrant from Lagos, which is in Nigeria, and started a new life in the UK, aged 14 with nothing at all. And then he started his career as a chartered accountant, which kind of makes sense how he kind of dived into the world of personal finance with his background um, and working his way up through a successful 15-year career for multiple entrepreneurial businesses to become a CFO in the investment uh, business. And then he took the big leap in April 2020, yes, very recently, to focus on the Humble Penny full-time as a passion project. And he's been doing some amazing things ever since he took that big leap. So I can't wait to share that interview with you. But before I get to that interview with Ken, here's just a few words about uh, this episode's sponsor, which actually happens to meet me. I'm taking the spot. Um, I, you know, always have some sort of external, you know, sponsor or advertiser for my episodes. And I'm like, you know what? I actually have something that I really want to share and make sure you hear and and, and find out about because I know, you know, I do mention it usually at the end of an episode, but I know most people don't listen to the end of a podcast episode. So says my husband, because he says I I never do. Um, So uh, I wanted to let you know, if you are unaware, I currently have a very new, literally just launched a month and a half ago, uh, investing course. So you may remember, I mean, if you've been a long time listener of the podcast, I originally had a course called um, Investing Foundations for Canadians. I shut that down in, I believe, December 2020 because I wanted to give it a huge overhaul and then launched my wealth building blueprint for Canadians in uh, February 2021. Um, so it is basically the course that I wish existed when I was just learning about investing in my 20s, even in my late 20s, and was really trying to find answers to my questions. I just want someone to show me how to actually, you know, build my own ETF portfolio. How do I rebalance that portfolio? Or should I use a robo advisor? And what does that mean? Or what are some of the core things I need to know about investing and developing my own investment plan. These are things that uh, I now know because I've had the podcast for almost six years. I'm working towards becoming a CFP. I've done the Canadian Securities course. I've been teaching people about investing and personal finance and money management for years now. So finally, I was ready to package this in one comprehensive course so I can teach you, the you know, my wonderful podcast listener, how to do it. You can literally start this course with hardly any know-how when it comes to investing. I'm going to walk you through it all. I'm going to talk about investment products, uh, different investment accounts. So we are going to dive deep into, you know, registered accounts, unregistered accounts, taxes, all that kind of stuff, you know, benchmarks, indexes, indexing, um, and diversification, all these buzzwords that you hear all the time on the show that you may or may not quite understand. I go through it in depth and uh, really share, this is how you start investing. 
investing if you want to invest in a passive way so you can ultimately build your wealth. So if you want to learn more about my wealth building blueprint for Canadians course, um, of course, you can check out the show notes for this episode 277 is the episode number. So you'd go to jessicamorehouse.com slash 277 or just go to my shop page, jessicamorehouse.com slash shop. That is where you can find the link to uh, more information about the course. There's already over 100 people in the course and they've been making some crazy strides on their journey to building wealth, getting out of those high fee actively managed mutual funds and into a portfolio of low cost index ETFs. And I really do walk you through every single thing. On top of that, there's a private Facebook group for students. And I also do a live biweekly Q&A call. So you can also ask me your questions directly live. So, so many exciting things in the course. Make sure to check it out, jessicamorehouse.com slash shop. Welcome to the More Money Podcast, Ken. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Hey, hey, hey. Hi, Jessica. How are you doing? Good. I'm a huge fan. I feel like I've been following you for a while and a big, re- I, well, first I love the name of your uh, brand, the humble penny. Maybe that's me being Canadian. <laughs> being humble, I don't know, but I just love your brand. It really is so positive and brings a smile to my face. Whenever I see any of the content you put out, Amazing. it just makes me feel good, which, you know, when you're online, sometimes it's hard to find those kind of voices that make mm-hmm. you feel good, but also are educational. So bravo. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, it it was never really a brand when we started. We just came up, my, my wife came up with a name and we thought, yeah, this sounds kind of good. It's it's available, uh, you know, for 99p, let's buy it and start. <laughs> yeah. So so it's interesting to see, you know, see, see it becoming a brand and seeing people connect with it in a very different way. So when you started it and you started it in 2017, what was kind of the the goal of it was it just oh let's start this just for fun or did you kind of have some um you know plans to maybe maybe make it more than that yeah so it started as a passion project as a so my my background i'm actually a, a trained chartered accountant so i i'm a finance guy uh so i didn't think i had a creative muscle in me at all so the blog was my way of saying to myself i've seen all these people these internet people making it happen and they're doing these really cool fun things and i'm in my cubicle i just love to try something else i just love to just try you know and see if i could maybe have myself heard by the world somehow so the humble penny became essentially my my blank canvas where i would just talk about stuff related to money but from my perspective because i felt there was no one really speaking to people who looked like me or who came from my background uh, as a first generation immigrant to the uk i just felt there was just the narrative out there i just didn't feel like you know there was people i could point to and say hey i I followed that blog because i could really connect with him or her in a in a way that was quite close to who i was and where i came from so i wanted to talk about money in a really simple way in a way that anyone could relate to you know um and that's what became my concept for the humble penny as a blog Mm -hmm. i'm curious what was kind of the landscape you know in your view before you started your blog of other blogs or other kind of content creators in the personal finance space in the uk i mean i i feel like i could (laughs) totally identify with you like when i started my blog i mean a little bit earlier than you but it was the same thing there's not a lot of women um talking Mm -hmm. about money it was really just a bunch of old white men and you're like cool 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 Mm -hmm. not relate (laughs) so Mm -hmm. i'm gonna start Mm -hmm. some and also similar to you i wanted to have a creative outlet because i also worked in a cubicle so i'm like i need something to live for (laughs) yeah 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 but yeah tell me what 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 did it kind of look like um and has it changed over the years or is it still it's kind of the same (laughs) oh yeah no so it's changed a lot so back then which it sounds like it sounds like i'm saying it's like oh back in the 20s no it was only three years ago (laughs) (laughs) um uh there were there were a handful of blogs that were you know, been created by people who were of a particular demographic, and those blogs had a particular readership. And um, you know, there wasn't really, if I had to be really blunt, a blog that was created by a black guy who who had a family, which is my which was my situation. Um, so I felt like I was coming in as a kind of a stranger to a party, and. 
I didn't know where I fitted in. I didn't have any allies. I didn't have any, you know, like people who I could point to. In fact, the people who I admired were people in America, you know, the American bloggers and people like that. Because I thought, oh, you know, there's blogging things taking off in America. And I've been uh, heavily interested in the subject of financial independence as an area because my wife and I, uh, we met at a property investing seminar. And oh we, we had, yeah, we'd set <laughs> off together after reading uh, this, this random book, which many people know about, called Rich Dad Poor Dad, back in 2008. We, we, we set off together and became friends. And um, uh, anyway, this subject of financial independence was actually an, an area I was interested in. Uh, so starting the blog, I felt that that was a, an interesting area for me to talk about from my perspective, because there were not really many people, even people who looked like me, who talk about that subject, let alone talk about it from an aspirational perspective. So, but since we started, there's been all these sudden, all these blogs have shown up and, and it's been really interesting to see the change. There've been lots of blogs by women, lots of blogs by black women, lots of blogs by um, other people from other kind of backgrounds. That, were very, that was very different to what life looked like in December 2017 when I was kind of kicking off. So it's just very interesting because in fact, I've had people message me saying, Ken, do you know what? Because I saw you, And because I saw you doing it, I believe that I could do it as well. Wow. Isn't that cool? Like that is pretty amazing, especially too when you, you know, when you started, you're like, well, I'm going to start this thing and we'll just see how it goes. But I'm just doing this as kind of a hobby. I don't have like Mm -hmm. any, you know, big plans. Mm -hmm. And you've inspired other people to do the same. And I think that's the kind of amazing thing. Sometimes I feel like we... Uh, you know, as individuals are like, what kind of impact can I make? It's like, you can make a really big impact by just taking that chance and doing something outside of your comfort zone. And because I, I think that's the other thing too, a lot of people may not realize this, but yeah, you like, if you don't see someone like you or a similar voice to you out there, then maybe that's, you know, kind of the opening for you to be that person. But sometimes that's, you know, you don't maybe think of it that way. And then that can kind of create that ripple effect. Yeah, I think it's, do you know what it is, Jessica? It's the fear. The fear holds people back. Oh, yeah. I had the same fear. I feared, I just feared being laughed at by people and being judged. And I'd come from a professional background. I'd worked in venture capital. I'd worked in, you know, just in asset management in a very, very kind of traditional um, areas of, you know, work, you know, there was a very clear career pathway. So for someone like me who would be attending board meetings and, you know, be wearing a suit and stuff, suddenly start talking about blogging and writing about like stuff on the internet was very much frowned upon. You know, people were just, you know, it was just not a normal thing to do. And so I think to your point, I think fear of being judged paralyzes a lot of people because they just they really fear telling their story, you know? And what I found is, is that, you know, the story is actually the gold mine. The story is the thing that people want to hear because like it's what connects and builds a bridge between the storyteller and the people, the audience, the people listening. And the blog provides the medium for that to happen. But most people don't really realize that their stories, no matter how bad they think their stories are, are actually their assets. They're actually what they need to almost unravel and let the world see. And it's that fear that holds people back from actually taking that leap. And I'm hoping that our journey is kind of helping people realize that, you know what, you know, it's about time, it's about time people heard your voice, you know, and um, and, and kind of heard your story because that story is important, not just for you, but that story is important for other people. Right. I mean, that's the big reason why I got into this is I read other people's blogs and and, and a lot of them from women. And I'm like, well, this is cool. I didn't know people were talking about this and they're being so vulnerable. I mean, people were sharing their how much they made, how much they spent, their net worth. I'm like, what? People sharing their numbers? This is wild. And it, you know, it, it makes you feel like, oh, OK, people are talking about it. Maybe not in my, you know, my friend group or at work, but there are kind of circles maybe online that are doing that. And then then you can kind of feel part of something something different, which is really cool. Did you, I'm, I'm curious, since you kind of mentioned, you know, the fear of being judged was, mm-hmm. you know, a, you know, a big thing for you. Did you feel like that actually happened or was that just kind of a fear? Once you kind of did it, you're like, oh, actually wasn't as bad as I expected. Oh yeah. I mean, I was definitely judged. I mean, I was oh, definitely oh. judged. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, first of all, my friends would not talk about it that, you know, they would not interact with my content, you know, 
people were not sure how to respond, you know, like, who, why does he feel he's the guy to talk about this? Why is he really? sharing about his personal journey? Why, you know, there were many question marks. And it was, and this is so interesting, Jessica, it's so fascinating, the psychology of life. It's not until you start to have some success that people suddenly feel, oh, I now want to talk about it. They want to go, oh, I know that guy. He used to, he's one of my friends or, you know, <laughs> we used to work together. He's one of my ex-colleagues, you know, because, because I realized that people want to be associated with success, Jessica. Mm. Yeah. This is it. You know, <laughs> but 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 where does a question mark over what you're doing when they're not quite sure if it's going anywhere? They are afraid to commit themselves to it. No, that's true. <laughs> At yeah. least now you can be like, well, I told you so. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, well, you know, I kind of feel like we're still we're still at the inception stages. I know we're only three years into this journey. I kind of feel like, wow, there's just so much more ahead. And it's really exciting as to what the possibilities are. Yeah. So yeah, tell me because yeah, it's it's for me, especially since I've been doing this for almost a decade. And it's so it's been a bit of a slower burn for me <laughs> to get to where I am. It's like it's been a, a journey. You've, you know, been able to achieve so much in such a such a short amount of time, which is amazing. Tell me a little bit about what kind of change? Obviously, you started the blog, mm -hmm. but now you have a YouTube channel. You mm -hmm. have a huge audience now. You have, um, you know, your membership program. Kind of tell me, how did things kind of evolve to where they are now? Where now you're running your own business full time? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so very interesting. So, it's interesting because when I when I started the blog, um, the blog was just a place where I wrote stuff down, and I started to really reimagine what a blog was. Having seen my, you know, kind of called them American colleagues or maybe Canadian people, people basically who were, you know, uh, who I was used to seeing in their blogs and some UK people who were kind of upcoming and things like that. I started to ask myself, like, what this whole idea of blogging, what does it actually mean beyond the creative uh, pursue how can we turn this thing into a business something that actually generated an income how do we actually do it and do something how do we take some risk with this stuff beyond just writing articles how else could we monetize this thing beyond advertising and affiliate income what else could we do and in 2019 in the summer around may 2019 my wife and I thought, and we've been sitting on this idea for some time, we thought, how about we just try video? Why don't we just try something else, you know, and see where it goes? But I had a huge fear, you see, Jessica. I'd, I've grown up being labeled as shy through my oh, life. Oh, yeah. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I had this thing where, you know, I just didn't know how people would react, you know, my story, not everybody – you know, where, you know what, how would people take it? Would I be judged a lot on the internet? Would people write hateful comments, you know, below videos? But then in the end, we said, you know what? We're just going to have a go. We're going to make one video. My wife said she was going to learn video editing. So we started learning video editing whilst I started to learn how to practice and record myself um, for a YouTube video. And we put, we put the first video out and it went pretty well in that it, it, it did not go viral or anything <laughs> like that. But people did not, you know, the world did not fall apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. And people responded fairly, you know, fairly decently to the video. And so we then said, you know what, we're now going to turn this blogging thing into see the Humble Penny as a platform rather than as a blog. So the Humble Penny would become a platform that existed across different spheres one of those spheres would be the YouTube platform. And so we made a decision to create one piece of high quality content per week and then uh, moved on to creating two pieces of quality content per week. And that became, I can tell you, the biggest change in um, building an audience because the, the likability and trust happened so much quicker via video because and also, um, we were able to attract, we reached our first million views on YouTube so much quicker because people were able to um, connect with us and people felt like the way I explained things, they could understand it. It was very simple. I was able to break down complex topics into very simple ideas using very simple analogies. I was able to add humor, emotion, things that I struggled to articulate on a blog. Yeah. And plus, they could see me. And so they're like, oh, this is the guy. This is the guy. I feel like I kind of like this guy or mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I like this guy. You know, that yeah. kind of, at, least, <laughs> at least they could make a judgment. They could decide, you know. And so it meant that 
people were reaching out a lot quicker. You know, so many comments, so many emails. That's when we knew, actually, this thing could begin to take off in the, um, the YouTube platform. And it's honestly, it's been the best decision ever. The YouTube platform is single-handedly the one thing that moves the needle the most in our, in our lives right now. And I, I kid you not, because, because you are almost see as you are in complete control in that you decide what you create, you speak in your own voice, you speak to who you want to speak to, and the YouTube algorithm does the work of promoting your content rather than me having to go and do Pinterest and do, you know, work on organic traffic, which we still do on the blog. But the algorithm and the fact that we're building an, a, a, an authentic community on YouTube does the work for you. So the hardest part of actually creating on a platform like that is actually doing the creating. And once you're done, you're not spending so much time marketing the content, it markets itself. And so this became a huge game changer for us. And we got another big change was we got selected by um, YouTube for something called the Creator on the Rise Award. Ooh. And yeah, they reached out and said, look, we've our, our systems have told us that your channel, there's something about it that could really take off. So we're giving you this, this award as the creator on the rise. And that was in January 2020 um, as the creator on the rise. And we were like, wow, this is incredible. And they put they basically took our channel and put it on the homepage of YouTube for an entire day. And our channel mm. grew on the oh, back yeah. of that. Uh, like they, they put it on like their trending tab or whatever. Um, and that became a, a, a big thing. And so the, the biggest, almost the biggest game change for us has been about staying consistent, being very clear on our messaging on YouTube and building an authentic community on that platform. And then there's other stuff that happened, which we can speak about later around the, the YouTube black and, you know, being selected by, by Google. Yeah, let's. I saw that, and I'm like, that is pretty cool. Tell me a little bit about that because that sounds so exciting. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So Google made an announcement in I think it was last year, 2020, uh, where they said they were gonna um, they were gonna fund basically they've got 100 million dollars to fund um, black black creators globally, and so they went on this this drive to try and find creators globally who they thought had the potential to grow. Um, and have real impact uh, in their communities and, 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 and stuff like that and tell positive stories about their communities. And um, we, we got chosen to be one of those 112 global creators from literally everywhere across the world, from Africa, from, the, from, from America, from everywhere you can think about, Australia and so on. We were one of those 112 people. And I, I never forget the phone call. We got contacted by them. They said, hey, come and meet us. Let's sit down and just have a chat about your, your channel. And they sat down and said, hey, you know, we're, we're writing you guys a check and we would love for you to join an incubator. We'd love to help you to grow your channel. We see a lot of potential in what you do. And that's a huge validation, Jessica, because for the first time we've been, we've been grafting, working really hard for like a year. And suddenly this comes about and they're like, look, we believe you can go so much further because you're 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 seen as an authority on YouTube, um, and we thought, wow, you know, and this became a huge thing for us. And we've been on the incubator now for some time, uh, learning basically the business of YouTube, um, uh, whilst obviously still running the blog and everything else related to that. Funny, because it's a, I, I I mean I am not a YouTube sensation, but I do see the <laughs> the potential, and it's mm -hmm. like I don't know how you were able to or still do create such consistent content. My God, video is so <laughs> difficult to do, especially when you're doing other things in the background. You know, you've got your blog and all these other things like that is difficult. But it is, it, isn't it so fascinating that you try one thing and you're, you know, pretty successful with the blog, but then it was something else that was actually the game changer for me. It was the podcast mm -hmm. and it was something that like I'd been blogging for like five or six years at that point and it mm -hmm. like never really took off. And I'm like, should I just give yeah. up? I'm like, let's just try something new. But again, that fear kind of came in. What if no one listens? What if people hate it? Da -da 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 -da. But it's like, you just don't know. And isn't that kind of cool that you can now look back? You're like, that was the thing that changed changed everything how cool yeah. is that yeah it's it's incredible and i think for anyone listening and this is a big lesson i've learned on this journey is that it's really about having this experimental mindset of of, of almost of almost exploration so when you're doing one thing you know 
always asking yourself, how else could I apply the same concept across a different medium? And just to see how that might turn out, you know, I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, it seems like a different life before YouTube. Um, and had we not tried it, God, I wonder where we might have been been now, you know. Yeah. Um, in fact, it, it, it was it became so good that YouTube asked us to do a workshop for them, teaching people how to create uh, an authentic community on YouTube. And oh my gosh, it, you're like, we're teaching people? Yeah, like- <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're teaching people. And, we're, and we've only been on this journey ourselves for barely 18 months on YouTube. So, you know, it just shows what's possible, you know. Um, and, I, you know, I honestly, if anyone who's listening who is maybe afraid to take the leap, potentially, to try things out, you do not lose anything for experimenting, honestly. Um, it's it's honestly it's it's the best thing we've ever done trying out the YouTube platform, and it's what it's done is actually expose our brand now more globally. Well, yeah, I'm in Canada and I discovered you. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. So it's like there's a diff. You can just reach so many more people, which is so yeah. exciting. There's yeah, there's just so much more possibility, and, and let's not forget, you obviously get paid um, for creating on YouTube. You know, you get paid for you know by the you know by google adsense for for creating and of course you know the best you know for those who are listening you know who might be interested in kind of content creation and online online businesses and things like that um the best thing about youtube for us in fact you mentioned our membership earlier our membership mm-hmm. program we know that anything between 65 percent and 75 percent of our members came from youtube wow yeah I mean, it makes sense when you think about the platform, because I mean, I I love YouTube. I'm on there all the time watching videos of other creators. You're an engaged watcher or viewer. Mm -hmm. A blog is a little bit more passive. Great information, but you Mm -hmm. may not have that personal connection. But when you're watching someone on YouTube over and over, you feel like you know them, you know, and that's pretty special. Like you create this really strong uh, connection with them, which is, is pretty cool. But yeah, it's, I think so many people, and I mean, I, I, you know, still feel like this when I'm trying something new or want to, you know, experiment, like you said, there's really no downside to experimenting. I think Uh we're just so focused or uh, I don't know, we're conditioned to be afraid of failing instead of just try it out. If it doesn't work out, maybe let's not label it as a failure because that's so negative. Just be like, okay, it didn't work out. We learned a few things. Let's move on to the next. But I think sometimes we don't focus uh, enough on, but what if it succeeds? You yeah. Know? yeah. I think we really don't focus enough on, but what if it actually works out? We're always just like, what's the worst case scenario? It's like guaranteed it won't be as bad as your worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, we haven't even really touched on this, but you were able to achieve, um, you know, fire financial independence by a very young age, 34, <laughs> which is also crazy. So when in the process did that happen? Was that a little while ago? Was that on your kind of journey of creating the blog? So that actually happened in 2017 before oh. we launched the blog. So 2017 oh, cool. in the summer um, was when we were able to say that had happened. So I was, I was 34, in tw- <laughs> giving, giving my age away here. <laughs> I was 34 in 2017. Uh, and then we started to tell the story. We launched a blog in December 2017 on the 3rd of December. Um, and that that actually was instrumental in helping me have the confidence to quit my job as well. Because, um, because we were uh, at a good place. We paid off our mortgage. We built up good investments and savings and so on. We had property assets. So we're basically in a good place uh, financially. But um, I always thought to myself, it would be incredible if this thing that I was starting to decide became something that was actually sustainable, i.e. it covered its own costs, it broke even, because we were starting to develop costs. We've got a team of six people now, you know, a video editor, uh, a community manager, a tech VA, a social media person, and then there's me and then there's my wife, right? So in addition to, uh, obviously, costs of running a platform, technology and things like that, so our goal then became: had we um, had we not just rely on on our own money, but had we like turn this thing into something that could actually generate some income? Uh, and so the whole monetization journey began um, uh, about twelve months after we started a platform, and that was to try and get ourselves monetized via MediaVine. You've probably heard of them um, ad ad platform. And once we did that, that started to provide some regular income, which we then reinvested back into the whole platform to start to explore other ways such as creating our own 
online courses and things like that. Amazing. Gosh. Yeah. That will, that I've heard, you know, lots of people on the show have come on the show and that's kind of what kind of inspired them to maybe try something new or experiment is like having that financial independence or at least on their way to financial independence. And it seems like yeah. that's been something that you were, you know, even if you didn't do the blog, like that's something that you were, um, you know, trying to do. I'm curious because everyone seems to have a different strategy or system uh, or even, uh, you know, definition of, you know, FI. What does that mean for you? How did you you determine, yes, we are now officially FI. Yeah, so for us, it was simply a point where our costs, first of all, our cost base had fallen significantly. So the home we live in, we bought in 2012, our primary residence, um, with a house paid off and with our investments in other assets, so our property, other property assets outside of our primary residence, as well as uh, investments in the stock market, which we started in 2009 slash 10. Um, as soon as the income from those areas, as well as from other, we also run a nursery, a childcare business uh, outside of what we do. We do it as a, as a family, though, not just me and my wife as uh, broader siblings and my parents. Uh, the, essentially, the income from all our um, other activities um, was essentially able to cover our costs easily. You know, our kind of ongoing costs of operating our, our family life. Um, so as we got to that stage, we we knew, in addition to having a, a, a good uh, savings buffer and, you know, investments and so on, we knew that we were at that place where it become optional, really. The big question I then had, the big question mark really was, I've been building a career so far. I've spent the last 15, 16 years developing this career you know, I am a chief financial officer. I I earn a good six figure income. I've been earning six figures for some years now. Should I should I you know should I carry on? Do I have a desire to carry on doing what I'm doing, working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, or is there something else I could do? Really, especially as my children were getting older, I've got an eight year old and a six year old with my wife. You know, do I want to play a better role in my in my own personal life? Do I want a different life altogether? Yeah. My wife and I always did. We wanted I wanted to play more more of a role as a father. I wanted to be more present. Um, and also, I wanted to have a go at really doing the things I've been doing for years. Lots of side hustles, you know, as, as immigrants to a country. And I don't know if you know much about how immigrants kind of get through life. But a lot of immigrants kind of, you know, start off with a focus on survival. And for me, that began with creating side hustles with family members, joint ventures and things like that. So I've always been entrepreneurial, but I'd never gone away and done it fully. You know, and so getting our finances in order, getting our money journey to a place where we were actually okay. You know, we were not like um, we didn't have abundance in in in, in income. We were in a good place financially. It meant that we'd basically de-risked our lives to a, a, a large extent. Uh, you know, it gave me the opportunity to decide. Well, actually, I might. This is now the best time. Twenty essentially, twenty twenty was a gift. Jessica, mm. because I've been working these crazy hours in my day job, also working, you know, putting in 20, 30 hours a week on my own side, hustle on the side, and as well as being a, a husband, being a parent to two children, as well as homeschooling as a result of COVID. There's so much going on. That point was essentially a turning point when I thought, okay, this is it, you know, enough, enough of being afraid. Now is the time yeah. to kind of back myself and see where this takes me. Did you find it? I mean, it sounds like you you were ready to make that decision, but were you, I don't know, worried about, I guess, leaving that career you've built up or also even that salary? Was that a difficult decision to make? Or, you know, looking back, you're like, no, it was, it was an easy decision at the end of the day. No, no, no. no. It was ex extremely difficult. Yeah. Because, come on, who, who does not like getting a regular six-figure salary every year? Yeah. <laughs> like I've worked, I'd worked all my life to get to this stage. You know, I'd worked, you know, I'd, I'd taken professional qualifications. I'd done an MBA at the University of Cambridge. I'd done, so, I'd worked hard to get to this stage, you know, and this was, this was the only identity I had. It was really who I had become after about 15 years of working in the city of London in the financial services area. So to give that up was very difficult. In fact, I had anxiety. I was very afraid of giving that up because you know you're used to on the in a particular date on each month 
There would be, you know, a paycheck coming in. You were used to having that, and that paycheck offered a specific lifestyle without you having to dip into your savings and things like that, you know? So it's quite hard, but but I, I, I also knew, given the buzz and the interest and the excitement and the Im- impact we were seeing with the Humble Penny, that, do you know what? This, this thing could potentially become, in fact, my brother said to me, this thing would become your legacy. Ooh. And I, I, yeah, and I, and, I, and, I, and I believed him. I believed him when he said that. And I thought, well, what, he, what if he is right? What if I gave up on this and I gave up on this legacy journey? But what if, what if he's right and I carried on and this became the thing that really changed our lives and changed the lives of millions? And that was the bet I had to weigh up. I had to weigh up, you know, there's a six good six-figure salary then you know, and a, and a good job. A secure job, well, secure rich. Yeah, no I job's mean, really yeah. secure. Yeah. Um, versus the opportunity to really run something that I love that could actually match my day job in income, and um, uh, but would have the potential to have impact for millions. When I when I did that analysis, it became very clear. My wife said to me, "This is this is it. This is the opportunity. Let's do it." And and that was it. Yeah, you don't want to regret. You don't want like you know thinking about regret. It's like. I don't know, like you'd probably regret not, you know, taking this chance, but you may regret staying in your job a little bit longer and just, you know, starting to really hate it. You never mm-hmm. want to get to that point of uh, of super burnout. Did you get any pushback from anyone in your family or friend circle who, you know, because it is, I mean, I got some pushback, I'll be honest, when I decided to quit my corporate job, because I think most people are like, what are you crazy? You have a yeah. good job. What are you doing? Yeah. No, I, I didn't tell anyone. Oh, that's a good strategy. Just don't tell just, anybody. Just no, do it. No, 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 I didn't tell anyone. I just went ahead and did it. Then I called my mom, called my dad and said, okay, this is it now. I'm running the business full time. And they were like, uh, are you sure? I'm like, yep, <laughs> we're doing it. And then I explained, this is where we are financially. You know, there's potential in what we're doing. And, you know, this is how, this is why it matters, you know. And they understood because I come from an entrepreneurial family, you see, mum and dad, my mum, my dad, my sisters, my brother, everybody runs a business. I was the only one who had a normal day job. So for them, it was like welcoming back their son. Oh, know. good. Yeah, yeah, no one in my family is an entrepreneur. Um, like no one in any part of my family. And so when I said, uh, oh, I'm going to start my own business, they're like, are you crazy? Yeah, I can, I like can we're see a that. family of employees. Yeah, um, yeah You yeah. know, stay at your job for 30 to 40 years kind of thing. Yeah, and so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it, but you know what, I, I, for me, I got a lot of, uh, support from my husband who's been self-employed since I've known him. So for like 13, 14 years. So, so that was good. And, and like you said, it's one of those things you do it and you're like, I'm so glad I did it now. I wish I almost did this sooner. Right. Yeah. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about your membership program, which I think is so awesome. Cause I also <laughs> kind of feel like this is also, you know, my view. It's like, I don't know, is it, is personal finance kind of a, still a very niche kind of small thing in the UK? Are you kind of one of the leaders of it? So personal finance is become a bigger thing in the UK. It did not used to be like that. So our, and we are one of the, uh, I'd say one of the, the key voices um, in, in this space here in the UK. Uh, so we launched in, in, in <laughs> talk about timing, in Feb 2020, just before the pandemic, here in the UK, we launched a platform, a sister company called Financial Joy Academy at financialjoyacademy.com. And that name, in case anyone wondered, came out of our tagline for the Humble Penny, which is create financial joy. So we took the words from that tagline and created essentially this, this platform. And the reason we created it, and I'll tell you why, we had many people who would reach out to us, as you probably do, Jessica, who say, hey, can you offer me some mentoring? Can you offer me some coaching? I need some help. Then you say to them, this is how much it's going to cost because, you know, my time costs a lot of money. And they'll go, oh, that's actually pretty expensive. Uh, I'm not quite sure I can afford that. And then they disappear. And so my wife and I thought, well, actually, instead of not being able to help so many people who come to us, how about if we created something that offered them so much value, but at such a little price each month? So the price of a takeaway, people who buy, you know, or order online on Deliveroo or whatever, you know, on a platform where they buy food, whatever they spend, what if they use that to actually invest in their lives for the future? And so we came up with the, the call it the UK's first ever platform uh, catering to, with a goal of helping families practically 
work towards achieve, achieving financial independence. So we our, our mission is to help 10,000 families in this 10-year decade from 2020 to 2030 to get on that journey and actually achieve that goal. It's, the, it's, it's a crazy goal for us, but we believe that it's actually possible because of what we're building. So essentially, the, the platform is a multi has a multi-dimensional value proposition. So it offers group coaching every every two weeks. Uh, we have essentially all our resources. We've got about thirty different you know courses and action plans and things like that within the platform. It's actually an actual platform itself, which we built. Um, we have a, a super supportive community as part of uh, the offering. We also have a method for keeping people accountable on a weekly and a quarterly basis, uh, as well as we have experts. So we have various people showing up to teach various things. So, um, and what we've noticed is that this has been the best thing. So beyond, actually, we thought when we started that it would be about helping people build wealth. But what we've noticed that is that this platform has actually become about helping be, people be, begin to believe that they can um, achieve their goals or to build good friendships or to create um, strong relationships or, you know, stuff like that. You know, so for example, one of the best parts of what we do is our 5am club. So every day from Monday to Friday, we show up at 5am and uh, on Zoom, it take, it's like a co-working space. People use that to work on their side hustles, to work on their various projects. And this is a benefit they get. And I show up, I read a book for about 10 minutes uh, to motivate people, or my wife reads a book, or she share, or we share like something we've learned in the week. Um, and that's, you know, it's what that has done for us is it's taken the whole blogging and YouTubing to a really, to create essentially a really intimate environment where you feel it's almost like a spiritual journey, like you're going on a journey with people that you know them so well, you know their wives, their children, their dreams, their goals, and you're literally helping them as well as everybody else, almost crowdfunding their ideas to help each person build wealth forward. Yeah, and for, for all of that, they're paying a small monthly fee, um, which I think it works out to be about $50 a month or something like that. That's amazing. I think, yeah, so many people would need something like that. And like you said, there's such a big need. I think when people, you know, are, are looking for information on how to, you know, better their financial lives online, lots of free stuff. But when it comes down to it, lots of people are like, I need some actual like accountability and some help. And it's, it's still very difficult to find someone who, I mean, I, I have conversations all the time, you know, from people like, oh, can you help me? I'm like, there's only so many people I can help, you know, time is limited. Um, and then when you're looking for other people who are kind of unbiased, they don't work for a financial institution, they're not trying to sell you some financial products, very uh -huh. hard to find that kind of help. So that's awesome that you've been able to create a platform. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I'd say as well, which I hope will really resonate with a lot of people is that we've got to remember that when we share our stories, people buy into us. Yeah. So they really want to, what you're really, what you really, what you're really giving people by creating a platform like that is proximity. So people feel they can actually get to know you and build a true relationship with you, but do it at an affordable price. So to, I almost think of it as an ethical way of uh, monetizing a platform because, you know, you're essentially crowdfunding lots of um, you know, ideas, lots of thoughts, like in our community alone, there are so many experts in so many things, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's the law, whether it's accounting, whether it's, you know, how to build a website. There's so many people, different niche, whether it's property investing, they're all within the platform. And so when you ask a question outside of me and my wife giving you answers, there are people who are actual subject matter experts who can also give you answers. So it's actually like, the best possible outcome. Uh, I highly recommend this idea to anyone who's thinking about how else could they create a sustainable uh, offering to their audience. This is actually a way that they might want to explore doing it. Yeah, definitely. I've got my wheels turning. <laughs> <You're> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. My gosh. Well, you know, it has been such a pleasure having you on the show. I feel more inspired just to kind of get keep on going, quite mm -hmm. honestly, get back on YouTube, make some more videos. Um, yeah. But also, I feel like it's, you're, you know, again, just another example of someone who 
uh, you know, you didn't have a blog. You, didn't, you were just doing your own thing, working your job, and you've changed your life completely. And you took a, a lot of risks, but calculated risks. And it yeah. just goes to show anyone can kind of change their life or do something different or get on a different path. It may not sure. feel easy internally, but it's possible, um, yes. especially when it comes to changing your own financial, you know, kind of destination. I think a lot of people get very focused on the present. We need to, you know, focus on the future and then, you know, just be patient and humble. <laughs> Stay, <Absolutely>. humble. <laughs> Stay humble. Absolutely. Stay humble. And have fun. Have fun. Have fun. We, we exactly. always end by telling people, be thankful and seek joy. The joy mm. is what it's about. You know, that's what it's really yeah. about at the end of it. You know, you have to, you have to feel like this whole thing is changing your life. Otherwise, there's no point doing it. So before I let you go, you know, I'm sure people will want to kind of check you out. Where can people find you online and find more information about the Financial Joy Academy? Yeah. So uh, first of all, you can find us at The Humble Penny on Instagram, where we have fun just sharing our journey. Um, you can learn more about our blog at thehumblepenny.com and The Humble Penny on YouTube. For Financial Joy Academy, just check it out at Financial Joy Academy dot com or at financial joy academy on instagram amazing well thank you so much for being on the show ken it was a pleasure having you likewise no thank you for having me jessica and that was episode 277 with Ken Okorafor from The Humble Penny. Make sure to check him out at thehumblepenny.com. And you can find him at the Twitter and Instagram, all at the humble penny very easy to find him of course find him on youtube because he's amazing on the youtube i need to take some tips from him so go to youtube.com slash the humble penny uh, i'll of course link to all of the places where you could possibly find him and, and uh you know start you know watching his youtube channel or following him on instagram i'm a huge fan of his instagram uh in the show notes for this episode so just go to jessicmorehouse.com slash 277 and of course if you want to find out the show notes for any episode you can either go to jessicmorehouse.com slash podcast or just go jessicamorehouse.com slash the number of that particular episode. So, 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 okay. Things I need to share with you. So first off, a little reminder, because I did share this at the beginning of the episode, in case you skipped through it, I'm going to let you know now I have my course, um, that if you're interested in learning to invest and actually me showing you how this is how, this is why, I mean, uh, this is why I created it. This is why so many uh, students have uh, started taking it and are really going through it through it, and, and doing some big changes with their um, investments, like, you know, getting rid of their actively managed mutual funds, which are super high fee and, and into something better like a robo advisor or, uh, you know, managing their own portfolio of ETFs using a discount brokerage. So uh, you can, uh, it's called Wealth Building Blueprint for Canadians. It is specifically for Canadians, which I think Canadians appreciate because we get a lot of information from our American friends, which is lovely, but also just like not helpful for us because, you know, we don't have 401ks here. So I really do walk you through every single thing that you need to know to really feel confident about investing and get started and actually take action. That's the main thing. So you learn about investment types, capital markets, account types, investment planning, retirement planning, how to use a robo advisor. I actually invest in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different robo advisors with my own money and show you exactly like I, I you know, walk you through it so you can see me uh, do it. And I also uh, go through self-directed investing or DIY investing as it's sometimes called and show you how to, you know, buy an asset allocation ETF or uh, make your initial contribution to your DIY ETF portfolio or, you know, make additional contributions and rebalance your portfolio, how to do all these different things to manage your own portfolio. Um, and there's so many other things that I haven't even, I didn't even share in the first part of this. So for example, um, I'm always creating kind of new lessons and new, uh, you know, resources that are helpful to my students. Like that's a great thing. Once you're a student, you, we have, you have access to the Facebook group and also the Q and A calls with me and you can ask me your questions. And a lot of those questions turn into new parts of the course that will help you. For instance, someone asked, Hey, can you explain how my investments are protected? Like, should I be worried that, you know, my money is with this robo advisor? And so I made a lesson about 
about how your investments are protected. Spoiler alert, there is some protections involved in case you're using a discount brokerage or a robo-advisor and they go bankrupt, so you don't have to worry about that. I'm also doing these really cool series called Expert Interviews, where I've interviewed experts from Tangerine, Quest Wealth Portfolios, Quest Trade, and BMO ETFs, and there's more to come. I'm going to hit up everybody I know in the industry so I can ask them specifically about their platform or their products because, you know, a, a lot of this is like, okay, we're ready to invest, but which one, you know, which platform should I use or which ETF should I put in my portfolio? So I'm going directly to the source to ask them all the questions that you want to know. So there's so many amazing things in this course. So just check it out. You can find more information in the show notes for this episode, jessicamorehouse.com slash 277, or go to my shop page, jessicamorehouse.com slash shop. Um, so that, okay. So, uh, besides that, um, I also want to remind you, I am running my book giveaway and, you know, I'm going to be running it until this, uh, podcast season is over, which so far in my little calendar I have at the beginning of June, um, we will see, but, uh, um, basically if you go to jessicamorehouse.com slash contest, or again, there's the link in the show notes, I'm giving away copies of all the books featured on this season of the show. How many books am I giving? giving away. Let's Google it. I think there's quite a few now. One, two, three, four. There's five different books I'm giving away. There's more to come because I have more authors coming on the show later in the season, uh, but enter to win. And I will, you know, I, I literally, you know, choose the people myself that or the, the winners and buy the books and mail it to you. So you even get a little special card from me, which is always kind of nice. Um, so make sure to check that out. Lastly, just want to remind you, since we talked a little bit about YouTube, and I'm obviously nowhere near as an expert with YouTube that Ken is with his channel, but I also have a YouTube channel that I am putting more effort into because I I want to I want to blow up. I want to like do this. Let's be the go to gal um, when it comes to personal finance, uh, you know, content in Canada on the YouTube. So check me out, jessicamorehouse.com/slash YouTube, or go into YouTube and just Google my name, Jessica Morehouse. You'll find me there, and also like hit me up over, you know, however you follow me on social media, Instagram, Twitter, or email, and let me know specific topics you'd like me to see on um, my YouTube channel. That's always helpful for me when I'm um, kind of figuring out what are some things that people want to know. Um, let's see. That's that. Oh, hello. I forgot the thing that I was you know, like kind of uh, teasing for a while. I'm sorry. It's just like, it happened. And then I immediately like forgot, you know, when something happens, you just immediately move on with your life. <laughs> or it's like so traumatic, <laughs> or stressful that you just don't want to think about it anymore. So um, thanks for sticking around for this a little bit. If you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, you already know the news. But like I mentioned in the past couple episodes, I was studying for a course called Financial Planning One through the Canadian Securities Institute it is one of the many courses that I have to take on the journey to become a certified financial planner. And good news I passed. Oh my goodness. It. uh, it really wasn't that bad. Um, but you know, it was still one of those things where it's like once I finished and then you immediately, you don't get your grade immediately, but you do get a pass or fail. And it said passed. I literally am like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And then I just like wanted to take a nap after cause it was just too much. It was just too much. So that's done. Thank you so much for sending me the support and the good vibes. Really, really appreciate it. Um, on to the next one, which unfortunately, unfortunate for me is called financial planning two and it is two textbooks and way more intense and it is giving me flashbacks of doing the canadian securities course which is you know uh, you know it that was just like i still have like nightmares of taking the cc exams and uh and i mean you know i'm not done like i've been talking to some friends who've done the cfp and i mean one friend said that she got an ulcer studying so I don't know if I know what I'm getting myself into, but here we are. and We're just going to keep it going. Right. And I kind of feel like me pursuing this because I have gotten some messages from people is has been like motivating for other people to either tackle something similar or this specifically. They're like, you know, I was thinking of doing this and now I'm going to do it because you're doing it. And fair enough. If me, little gal who honestly never did very well in math in high school, um, Though, I mean, I mean, I did. I just didn't really apply myself. Let's be And I also had some terrible teachers, so I do blame that. But anyways, um, I, I was never a math whiz. Let's just say that. And then has a fine arts degree. Um, if I can, you know, pivot and do this and do something totally different, 
Um, I kind of think anyone can do this. Like I've been getting so many questions about, do you need to have any financial background to like do the Canadian securities course? I mean, obviously it helps. It definitely helps, but, uh, I mean, it's kind of like anything. If you just read the textbooks and do all of the, the work, you should be able to learn it. Right. I mean, it's not easy. Hell it is not easy, but it's not impossible. So I think the kind of, uh, you know, message I'm going to leave you here with is, if you've been putting off something that you've wanted to try or wanted to pursue, take it from me, don't wait. Um, the one thing I do kind of wish is I wish I started some of these things sooner, right? Because life is short and I'm also getting older and I feel like by the time I actually achieve my CFP certification, I'll probably be closer to 40 than 30. So don't delay, do that thing that scares you. And what's exciting is once you actually achieve it, because you probably will, because I believe in you too, um, that feeling of actually accomplishing something that you thought you could never do is probably like, honestly, it's the best feeling in the world, right? You're like, wow, wow, I did that. You can do that. I believe in you. So go do it. So that is it for me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the More Money Podcast. I'll be back next week with another episode. Um, and yeah, take it easy. I mean, no matter where you are in the world, hope you're staying safe. I'm in Toronto. We're in another, you know, never ending lockdown. I mean, as if anything's ha like locked down again. Okay. Like nothing's happened. Like we've been locked down this whole time. So I'm just hanging out here in my home. So hopefully you're staying safe, staying sane, finding some joy in your life. And we're going to get to <laughs> we're gonna find the other side of this, man. I can't wait until this is over to finally do like one of my millennial money meetups. Maybe I'll take that on the road. I'm like so excited to see people. Oh, it's, it's unreal. So anyways, thanks so much for listening. A big thank you to my podcast editor, Matthew Rideout. Have a good rest of your week. Good weekend. Stay safe. I'll see you back here next Wednesday.